Amen. How y'all doing? Some of you trying to figure out who I am. Who is this stranger on stage with a mic in his hand? I am Pastor Kim's brother uh, from the same mother. <clears throat> the little Spitfire Ann Jones is our biological <laughs> birther. It's hard to believe the two of us came out of her, isn't it? If you've seen my mother, she's this little tiny, who knows where we came from. We're trying to figure out. Um, anyway, my name is Rob. I am uh, Pastor Kim's brother, and she is preaching in Columbus, Ohio today. Yes, at a conference uh, there in Columbus. And you get me. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time. I'm actually going to teach a little bit today. Those of you that are watching online, we welcome you. Glad you've chosen to join us. I also serve as one of the uh, board here at Limitless. And man, I just want to tell y'all, I'm so proud of what God is doing in this house. Yeah, man, there are some big things happening. Some even bigger things on the way. And uh, I'm just proud of y'all. I just want y'all to know, I'm the big brother, by the way. I'm two and a half years older than Kim. And uh, so I'm proud of y'all. I, I got a godly pride about what God is doing here. And I believe the best days are still to come. Can I get an amen in the room? My beautiful wife of 31 years is sitting on the front row, <laughs> Melissa Lee. She kept me around when I didn't deserve to be kept around. I appreciate that, baby. Uh, thankful for that. And uh, just glad to be in this space. I want to teach today. Can I teach just a little bit? <clears throat> I, we're going to look at some scripture, and um, I want to talk about a subject that, uh, I, I'll be honest with you, probably a lot of you have never heard um, the way I'm going to speak it. Maybe you've heard something along the lines, but I really believe that when I'm done today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to either make you really mad, or you're going to be so happy, you're going to be floating out of here. Because I want to talk about the subject, Freedom freedom you know the, the reality is so many in the body of Christ have been um, jacked up and 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 mostly because of and I say this with hu humility I've been in ministry for 32 almost 32 years full-time uh, I've been senior pastor lead pastor associate pastor worship pastor I've done everything and I'm convinced I've preached thousands of sermons I'm convinced what I'm going to preach today is the most important sermon that I ever preached. I'm just saying. The, the subject matter that I'm going to talk about today has the potential of setting you free. See, because most churches are filled with people who have been taught how to be victims instead of victors. Most churches are filled with people who have been taught mixture, law and grace, instead of Jesus. And we really don't understand what we have on the inside of us. Now, I'm also understanding in a, in a house like this, Pastor Kim's a big personality. She's got reach around the world and so I understand that sometimes we have folk in our midst or maybe watching online that you haven't even made up your mind about Jesus yet you just love her and how real she is and I'm so grateful I love her too she is one of my favorite people on the planet because I've watched her come through so much and I've watched her mature and grow and as I've watched her do that I promise you, she wants you to have what she has. You know that. I want you to have what we have. Because I promise it'll change your life. Can we talk about it for a minute? So most Christians spend their entire lives ch chasing things that they already possess. It shows up in the way we pray. It shows up in the way we serve. It shows up in the way we give or don't give. It shows up 
in our day-to-day -day life because, and I want to say this, there are a lot of guys and gals standing behind podiums like this today with a mic in their hand and people watching them who are not teaching the full gospel. They're teaching mixture. I've used that term twice now, and I want you to get it. They're teaching a mixture of law, works. I got to do, 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 do in order to get, 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 get. Instead of grace, which teaches us that Jesus has already done it all. And then offers it to us as a, a gift. And yet, pastors are teaching, prophets, apostles, evangelists, are teaching that we still have to somehow earn a gift. I ain't never cash up anybody that offered me a gift. I ain't venmo them. I ain't zelled them. I didn't go down to the ATM if you're still old school and withdraw. Nuh-uh. A gift is what? A gift. And how do you receive a gift? You receive it. You don't pay for it. You don't earn it. You don't have to get on your hands and knees, please, would you please give me the gift that you were offering me? And yet every Sunday, that's what people do when they show up at church. God, would you please heal me? And he's sitting on the throne saying, I already have. God, would you please bless me? And he's sitting on the throne thinking, I already have. God, would you please save my marriage? And he's thinking, sitting on the throne, I already have. Because everything that you need in this life to be a victor has already been provided. I'm absolutely setting the story up. I'm actually giving you the end before we even get into the meat because I want you to understand what I'm about to teach you is going to help you position yourself to live better on accident than you've been living on purpose. I need somebody to understand what I'm talking about. Some of y'all about to get set so free in this house because watch me greater is he that is than he that is in the world so many of us believe that God can do anything we're you were in the first service <laughs> he's already done it and so what we have to do is change our our perspective, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul said it very clearly. He said the way we are transformed is by the, the renewing of our mind. What was he saying? He was saying there's nothing new that I can give you. There's nothing new that I can offer you. What you've got to do is change how you think about what you've already been provided, what you've already been given. You've got to change the way you think. And I want to give you two scriptures that are not on the screen. The rest of them will be on the screen, but these two scriptures are not. If, you, if you've got pen and paper, pull out your iPhone, open the notepad, write these two down. You need to go look at them. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. This is the secret. Paul even called it a secret. He said, this is the secret. Colon. Basically, what I'm about to tell you is very important for you to receive this as truth. He said, this is the secret. Ready for, ready for this? Christ lives in you. He said, that's a secret. Now, what, I, what I've got to settle is this fact. Christ is not Jesus' second name. It's not Jesus Christ like Rob Jones. It's Jesus and then Christ, Christos, the Greek word Christos, literally means the anointing or the anointed one. And he's saying to us, we get caught up in the idea that Jesus lives in us. You need to get more caught up in the idea that his anointing lives in me. Why is the anointing so important? If we go back to the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, the Bible tells us 
that it's the anointing that does what? Breaks the yoke and removes what? The burden. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke and removes the burden. What's a, what's a yoke? What's a burden? A problem. Financial, marital, family, business, job, they're all problems. And they're all problems that come to stop us from walking in the blessing of God. And so when he's telling me the secret is that the anointing lives on the inside of you, what he's telling me is that everything I need to live victorious is on the inside of me. I just need to learn how to consistently access it. Jump over to chapter 2, Colossians, verses 9 and 10. Again, write these scriptures down because he makes it really, really clear. Is this helping anybody yet? Watch me. For in Christ, in the anointing, the one that lives on the inside of me, in Christ lives all the fullness of God. I'm going to run by myself if nobody's going to help me out today. Watch. So in Christ, the anointed one, who, where does he live? As a believer, online, y'all getting this? He lives inside of me. Watch me. In him dwells all the fullness of God. Not partial of God, not a little bit of God, not ever now and then God, all of God, the fullness of God. In human body, verse 10, I love this part. So you, everybody say that's me. So you also are complete through your union, your oneness with Christ. So watch. Can I, can I recap it? I'm going to teach for a minute. I'm going to teach just for a minute. Watch this. So the secret is Christ lives in me. The revelation is that in Christ who's in me dwells everything that God is. And so when I pray, I know we pray like this. We should be praying like this. Because he's right here. And everything I need is on the inside of me. And so I don't have to beg God to give me another thing any day of my life. God, please. It's already been provided. And so my responsibility is simply to access it by faith and that's what I want to help you do today. Can I talk about that for just a minute? That is the truth. When Jesus declared it is finished on the cross, you've heard this, and he gave up the ghost, the Bible says, he didn't say I am finished. He said it. What was it? It was the assignment. What was the assignment? The assignment was to defeat the devil once and for all. He defeated the enemy. Then we know three days later, or a variation of three days later, he rises from the grave. <laughs> he gets up out of the grave after having kicked the devil's teeth in. And he appears, and he the constant teaching to everybody that he appears to is... Uh, you've got power. You've got power. You've got power. You've got power. He tells the disciples, now I want you to go and wait in Jerusalem and tarry, which, by the way, is not a biblical truth <laughs> that New Testament believers ought to be practicing. We are not called, I'm going to help somebody, because we grew up in, I grew up in a Tarian church. Anybody grew up in a Tarian church? We, 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 we had to tarry. We had to wait on the Lord. Y'all remember? And it would be three hours later, and we still waiting on the Lord. And what I learned in my grown-up status is that God, ain't, we ain't waiting on him. He waiting on us. I grew up in a church where I had one mama on one side and another mama on the other side saying, hang on, turn loose. Hang on, turn loose. Hang, I didn't know which one to do. Hang on or turn loose. What am I hanging on to and what am I turning loose of? And we do that because we have messed up mentalities about God thinking that God is going to try to 
get, he's going to squeeze every little juice or whatever he can get out. He's going to make you feel so bad about what you did last night. He's going to make you feel so bad about how you acted yesterday. And the reality is God ain't even caught up in all that because he already knows the potential that you have on the inside of you. And if he can ever get you to let go of all the baggage in your life. I'm going to preach over here for a minute. If he can ever get you to let go of all the baggage in your life, you'll step into the power. And you won't be focused on not sinning. <laughs> You'll be more focused on how can I please God today? How can I live my life in love with Jesus today? How can I make sure my neighbor is taken care of and my sister is taken care of? We'll be so focused on how much God loves us that we won't be freaking out about how we can stay saved. Trying to figure out how to stay saved, Jesus. I just need to say, Lord, it's a mess down here. I don't know how to stay saved. And he's saying, just keep your eyes on me. But religion, everybody say religion. Religion likes to keep people in bondage. Religion wants you to stay bound up. And Jesus showed us how to get free. And so when we talk about this, what I believe is when Jesus said it is finished, he was saying everything that needs to be done has been done. Now I just need my kids to go walk this thing out. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. It's on the screen. Verse 6, Paul said, I am shocked <laughs> that you are turning away so soon from God. Now, let me, let me set this up for you. These people weren't quitting being... Israelites, Jews. These people were quitting what I'm teaching you today. Because, look at what he said. Who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. There's that word again. You are following, watch this. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. He said, somebody, if you go read it in the, uh, in the original translation, he said, some of these teachers are tricking you into thinking you got to get good enough to deserve what God has done for you. And he goes on to say in verse 7, but that's not good news at all. He said, you are being fooled by those who deliberately, notice, twist the truth concerning Christ. So here's the thought. I'm going to teach today. Y'all ready for this? Thought is this. The key to overcoming in this life is knowing this truth. It's knowing whose you are and who you are. It's simple. It's as simple as realizing that everything I need, when I said yes to Jesus, and if you haven't said yes to Jesus, we're going to help you with that today as well. When I said yes to Jesus, everything I would ever need to live this life was deposited on the inside of me. It's not something I've got to continually earn. It's not something I've got to continually work for. It's not something that I've got to, matter of fact, going to church won't make you any better a Christian than sitting at home. Giving of your tithes and offerings won't make you a better Christian than not giving. Watch me. I'm, I know some of y'all just got real happy right there. You're like, hallelujah. Serving won't make you a better Christian than what Jesus made you. And when you come to that revelation, watch me. You will want to go to church because you want to be close to God's people. You will want to give because you realize how much God has blessed you. You will want to serve because you realize that you were saved to serve, not to sit. God didn't save you so you can sit on the sidelines and watch everybody else do for him. God saved you because there's something on the inside of you that the world needs. And so it fires me up when people talk about, well, I, I don't believe giving is in the New Testament. Man, you are crazier than you look. We are supposed to be givers. Why are we supposed to be givers? Because God saw the world that he... And I'm like my daddy. 
And then my daddy's a giver. I want to be a giver. And so when people try to tell you, you don't have to give anymore, you stop listening to those people over there. They're just trying to take your money. No, honey, it ain't about taking money from you. It's about getting more to you. And the principle in the Bible is whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And so if you need more money, you need to be sowing money. If you need more love, you need to be sowing love. If you need more grace, you need to be sowing grace. If you need more peace, you need to be sowing peace. If you need more truth, you, I need somebody to hear me in the house today. Whatever you need more of, I've got to make sure it is flowing out of my life. We're not called to be the Dead Sea. All inlets and no outlets. <laughs> We're called to be a blessing. God said, I have blessed you so that you can be a blessing, not so you can can all you get and then sit on the can. No, he says, I've called, I'm, I've blessed you because I've got greater for you. I've got a greater truth ahead of you. I've got a greater experience, ahead, a greater assignment. Greater is coming your way, but I got to know that I can trust you where you are. So the key to knowing this truth, or to overcoming this life is knowing this truth. And if you understand and embrace these truths, can I be honest with you? You'll be ruined for what much of Christianity is today. It'll mess with you. It'll mess with you. Because you hear a lot of stuff that is anti what I'm teaching today, man. And sometimes it's because pastors are afraid if they teach you this truth, then you're going to make up your own opinions and run away from God. And I, I, what I've learned, and I've been doing this for a long time, what I've learned is that when I expose this truth to people, it causes them to fall more in love with Jesus. <laughs> it causes them to fall more in love with the church. It causes them to fall more not far. We don't, the church hurt doesn't happen as, as frequently when you fall in love with Jesus. So it's already been settled. Everybody say it's already been settled. Settled. So in order to understand where we are, we have to go back and figure out how we got here. Genesis chapter 2, let's look at it real quick. Let's go look back at the beginning. Genesis chapter 2. Can y'all bear with me for a minute this morning? I just wanted this, is it this afternoon? This afternoon. Just bear with me just for a minute. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. Verse 9, the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. Notice this next sentence. In the middle of the garden, everybody say in the middle of the garden. He placed two trees, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jump to verse 16. But the Lord God warned him. I know we want to blame Eve. But God didn't give the instruction to Eve. He gave the instruction to Adam. And it was Adam's responsibility to disseminate that information to Eve. Somewhere, something got lost in translation. And we, yes. And we want to blame Eve for the responsibility of Adam. I am convinced and it's not true in this room I see a lot of men in this house the church I'm a part of and, and, and lead at we have a lot of men in our church a lot of men but I am convinced one of the reasons most churches don't have very many men is because they haven't stepped up and taken their responsibility they think church is for the weak because they haven't Understood that yes, he is the lamb that was led to the slaughter, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when men begin to recognize that, what I've started to notice is that they start stepping up into place and they lead. This doesn't uh, uh, get uh, doesn't take away from what women have done. Thank God for the lady. Because the church would not be where it is today without some praying mamas, without some leading ladies, without some ladies that have gifts. And matter of fact, you know that in this house, your pastor. 
But I am convinced, fellas, I, that was a sidebar. That was free, right there, free. We need some men that are stepping up and leading. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Here's the thought. Ready for this? God's plan was perfect life forever in the garden. That was his plan. And so my questioning mind asked this. Lord, if that was your plan, why did you even put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden? Why? <laughs> you ever thought that? If his plan was for us to live perfectly in the garden with no issues, no problems, no trials, no tests, no challenges, no difficulties, why did you put the tree in the middle of the garden? Because you know we don't like being told no. How many of you have a toddler? Don't touch the stove. <laughs> don't touch the outlet. <laughs> we don't like being told no. And so I've wrestled with this. Why did you tell him no? And, and listen, this is what I came up with, y'all. This is what I came up with. I believe it was because God did not want a bunch of puppets for sons and daughters. He wanted sons and daughters that had a choice to serve him or not serve him. I need y'all to hear me in this room right now. He wanted people that would say yes to him because of him, not because they hadn't been given a choice. The choice was important. The problem with it is that, that he, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, by, 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 by not partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve would have effectively resided within the spiritual realm of immortality. They would have never died physically. And so then, watch me, so by disobeying God, they limited now their ability to do what God had put them on the planet to do, which was to take care of the, of the garden. And we pick it up in verse chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, why didn't he go to Adam? because Adam wasn't in his position. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Number one problem in the world today, fatherlessness. And we got all kinds of reasons why that is. And it's not just in America. It's on the planet. It's why we've got kids acting a fool. It's why we've got, I, I don't have time to get into all this, but, but y'all hear me. Who did the enemy go to? He went to the woman. Not because she was the weaker, because she just happened to be the one closest to the tree. She was hanging out where God was. But because Adam wasn't in his position and had not covered The enemy saw access. He says, oh, here's my chance right here. <laughs> Fellas, listen, I hope y'all, I, I didn't say this in the first service. I'm talking to some men right now. I need you to understand me. There's a place that God has created for you in your families, with your spouses, with your wives, with your children. And I'm telling you, the enemy is eating our lunch because we haven't taken our place. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. That was accurate. It's only the fruit from the tree. Notice the tree in the middle of the garden. She didn't even acknowledge the tree of life at this point. She's now only acknowledging the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, which was a little messed up too. If you do, you will die. The serpent replied to the woman, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will, here we go, be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. The problem with this is that they were already like God. 
They had been created in the image of God. And so they already had everything that God had. He had already provided them just like you and I with everything that God had. So then her mind has now changed. Her mind is now warped. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. Boy, that sounds like sin, huh? Just like sin. The alluring nature of alcohol, the alluring nature of the other. I'm going to preach better than that. I'm going to get better help than that. Y'all watch this. And its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then, notice, she gave some to her husband who now was with her, and he ate it too. And it was at that moment their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt, they felt shame. What does sin do? Bring shame, doesn't it? They felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Here's the thought. Here's the thought. If you're taking notes, write this down. Disobedient messed up the plan. I know. Look at me, guys. Disobedience messed up the plan. Satan used the main weapon that he has. Matter of fact, it's the only weapon he has, and it's deception, to create an opportunity to gain power in the earth. And this is still his weapon of choice today. God had given man all authority. Go back to chapter 1, verse 27. God had given man all authority. And Satan knew it. And he had lost his authority. And he's now trying to figure out how to get some back. And he's able to convince them to give him authority. He saw that Adam and Eve had something he wanted. They had unconditional authority. And he knew that if he could deceive them into giving it up, he would be okay. Can I tell you today, look at me, y'all. This is the only power. I'm about to help somebody, set somebody free. The only power the enemy has in your life is the power you give him. And the only way we give him power is by, watch me, by being deceived that we no longer sit in the position of authority that God has given us. And how does he convince us that we no longer sit in that seat of authority? By getting us to bite into the apple. Sin. Disobedience. And if he can get, I'm, I hear you, watch me. If he can get us, if he can get us convinced, if he can get us convinced that we no longer have access to God, he leads us into that place of rebellion, disobedience, where we lose everything that God has given us, not because God takes, us from, takes it from us, but because we abdicated it to the devil. We, we, we now have said, yeah, you're right. I'm nothing. I'm, 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 I'm a terrible person. I, uh, and we've abdicated to the devil. And so what I want you to hear me say, and I want to help you in the next couple of minutes. Will y'all give me a couple of more minutes? I know my time's up, but give me just a couple of more minutes because I got just a few things I've got to give you. Watch me. What we've got to learn how to do, and this is the battle. This is the battle. Everybody say, this is the battle. Say it again. This is the battle. The battle plan is when the enemy shows up trying to convince us that we're not good enough to be where we are. Our response should always be, you're right, I'm not good enough, but I serve somebody who's better than I am, and his name is Jesus, and he lives on the inside of me. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. See, what happens when you do that to the devil? The Bible says he fleas. First Peter chapter 5 says that when the devil roars about, roams about like a roaring lion, not that he is a roaring lion, he's roaming about like a roaring lion. I need you to hear me in this room right now. Listen, we have a responsibility to do one thing, and that's resist. How do I resist? The same way Jesus did in the wilderness. What, how did he resist? When the devil came at him trying to convince him, he just began to quote the word of God. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, when you don't feel adequate and you don't feel create uh, the ability to fight back, you got to learn. But, but listen to me. You better have some word in you. You can't be saying, well, Pastor Rob said, Pastor Kim said, 
No, you got to be able to say the Bible says when the enemy comes at your money, you got to be able to say the Bible says that he will provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. When he comes for your health, you got to be able to say by his stripes I am healed. When he tries to come for your mental to for your mental space, you got to be able to declare I am accepted in the beloved. I am everything that I am called to be. The problem with most of us is that when the enemy knocks on the door, we don't have any word in us. And so when the enemy comes in and says, you're defeated, we're like, hey, I feel defeated. We go from being victors to victims. We go from winning the battle to losing the battle. I need y'all to hear me in this room right now. You may say, but I'm all alone in this fight. No, you're not. You've got an army on your side. You've got angels surrounding you. You've got power and authority. Disobedience messed up the plan. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to go real fast. Watch this. Galatians 1 and 4 says, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned why in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live disobedience messed up the plan Jesus had to come on the scene and fulfill the plan I need y'all to get that right there disobedience messed up the plan Jesus came and fulfilled the plan and what I need you to understand is that Satan principalities and all of the other demonic powers have already been spoiled they've already been defeated go read Colossians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 3 Jesus has already defeated the devil he's not still seated in a place of power the only power the devil has is the power that we And the way we give him our power is by not knowing who we are. I'm almost finished. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Because I don't want you to misunderstand me. The devil's real. And he's relentless. And he'll keep knocking. Matter of fact, he'll knock one day. You'll be strong. He'll be like, all right, I ain't worrying about you today. I'll come back tomorrow. And then sometimes, I'm going to help you out with this one too, sometimes it ain't even the devil. It's us. It's our flesh. It's our inability to say no to the flesh. We want to blame the devil for sickness. It ain't sickness, it's Oreos. It's fried chicken. Mac and cheese down at This Is It. <laughs> We want to blame the devil for messing with our money. It ain't money. It's because you went out of the car dealership and bought you a car you can't afford. Walking around the car lot of Mercedes, pouring oil on. I claim you in Jesus' name. Then you walk in there and they like, how much money you make? I think we can figure it out. It's going to be 15% interest. Because we want to impress people who don't even know us. So how do we stay alert? Watch me, Ephesians 1 and 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I help you real quick? Watch this. Who what? Ha ho, ho, who has, past tense, blessed us. With every what? spiritual blessing this gets people messed up because they don't understand that money is spiritual they don't understand that r relationships are spiritual they don't understand that physical healing is spiritual so we think spiritual blessing well that's just the Holy Ghost that's the only blessing I got is the Holy Ghost. no honey everything that we need on this planet is spiritual I don't understand how, how does that work it's the same way with TV waves right now how many of you know that Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 11, Channel 46, all the Atlanta channels are right here, right now? They're right here. We can't see them. We can't feel them. We can't touch them. But if I were to bring an old TV in here and put some antennas on it and plugged it into an outlet, 
we could tune in. I need somebody to hear what I'm about to say. We could tune in to the TV channels that we're trying to, uh, to, we're trying to access. It's the same way in the spirit. You may not feel saved today, but because you know you're saved, all you got to do is plug in, baby, to the Holy Ghost. All you got to do is say, I believe. I may not feel it, but I believe that I am saved. It's spiritual blessings. And every spiritual blessing that you will ever need has already been provided. Three things. Ready? We talked about the two trees. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tree of light. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents religion. You got to do X, Y, Z to get God to bless you. You got to do, do, do to get, get, get. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life understands it's just about receiving the grace of God. It does three things. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil focuses on what you do. The tree of life focuses on what Jesus has done. Watch me. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil focuses on earning God's approval. I got to live better today than I did yesterday. No, you don't. You just need to know who you are. I said it earlier. And if you would learn to recognize that, you would live better on accident than you've been living on purpose. Tree of life focuses on just receiving God's love. Tree of knowledge of good and evil focuses on external duty. The tree of life focuses on internal desire. Too many of us have been trained by religion to believe that yes, Jesus saved me, but I have to work extra hard to stay saved. And the same power that saved you is the same power that keeps you saved. And it ain't yours. If you're a teacher, forgive me for saying ain't. Because you've done nothing to earn it. Should I say this? You can do nothing to lose it. I know it messes us up. I told you, you're going to be mad at me. Are you going to be really happy? Because everything most of us have been taught, you were raised in church, is it's grace that saves you, but you're the one that loses it. Well, what about repentance? I don't want to I'm, I'm almost finished, I promise. Watch me. What about repentance? Did you know the Bible very clearly teaches in 1 John that, that repentance is more about my relationship with people than it is my relationship with God? And we spend, yes, and we spend more time repenting to God than we do to people. And the Bible says that your sins, plural, have been moved from you as far as the east is from the west. You know why the Bible doesn't say the north and the south? Because they meet. The east and the west. <sighs> I rap with this. Two things you've got to do. First one is this. And this is simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. When the enemy comes in and tries to talk you out of being who you are, and he tells you you're sorry, you suck, you stink, you're bad. Every time he does that, your first response should be, okay, but let's talk about Jesus. Because every time you bring Jesus up, what does the Bible say? Demons tremble, man. They're like, ooh, don't, we don't want to talk about him. Because they know what he has done. You gotta keep your eyes on Jesus. Here's the second thing, ready for this? You gotta learn how to fight from a position of victory. We're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. 
So it's like this in military. If I've captured the hill, if I've got the flag, all the enemy can do is try to run up and take the flag from me. And as they're running up, what's my response? Pow! Kick them in the teeth. How do I kick them in the teeth? With the word. I just bring the word at them. The devil comes up trying to tell you that you are unqualified. I just remind him what Ephesians 1 and 3 says. That I am accepted in the beloved, man. I am saved, signed, sealed, delivered, prosperous. God has blessed me with everything that I did. It's already done. And when I don't feel like it, I have to act my way into a feeling. How do I do that? I act my way into a feeling by until I am convinced. Romans chapter 12. I don't stop speaking it. Until my mind, I know some of y'all, you have, if you're like me, your brain does some stuff, doesn't it? Right? Anybody got that brain? I got that brain. Reminded me of my past. Reminded me of my failures. Trying to scare the mm out of me. And I have to remind myself that it's not about me. It's about what Jesus did. And if I can keep my eyes on him, he's going to bring me through to the end. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm, I'm finished with this. Thank you, Penny. I appreciate it, man. Y'all did good. Keep playing. Don't stop. You got me in a groove. He, it's his fault. He got me in a groove up here. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, look at this with me. I think it's on the screen. Hebrews 12. 1B and 2A says, And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. I love this next statement. Who is the champion who initiated and perfected or initiates and perfects our faith. We aren't trying to get God to do something for us. It's already been done. We're simply reminding ourselves that he's already paid the price. Can you stand to your feet with me all over the room? If you're watching online, man, come on right there where you are. Some of you may need to push back your table and just get ready because I believe I want to pray a prayer over some of you today because I believe some of you, the journey is just beginning. The revelation of who you are and who God's called you to be and the power that he's deposited on the inside of you is just beginning. And if you'll get serious about getting God's word hidden in your heart, it will change everything about your future. It doesn't take away from the fact that you're going to have challenges. I'm just telling you, in this life, we are going to be persecuted. In this life, we are going to have difficulty. But what we've got to remind ourselves is that when the enemy shows up with a problem, I show up with a promise. I need somebody to hear me in this place right now. When the enemy shows up and tries to take from me what God has promised me, I show up and remind the devil who he is. He reminds me of my past. I'll remind him of his future. I need you to understand me in this room he ain't going to heaven that's why he's trying to prolong earth if you're in this room today and you've never said yes to Jesus maybe you've been kicking the tires checking this Jesus thing out religion has hurt you wounded you broken you busted you I'm here to tell you today you need Jesus you're online and you've never said yes to Jesus I'm gonna help you every head bow for just a minute every eye closed for just a minute if you're here and you would say pastor that's me I've never said yes to Jesus and I want to today I realize what he's done for me I know that I need him in my life I want you to hear me for just a moment Romans chapter 10 tells us that the way to receive Christ is so simple I have to believe in my heart that he died, was buried, that he rose again, and he did it for me. And then with my mouth, simply say, Jesus, I believe you are Lord, inviting you into my heart. Romans 10, 13 says you will be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a minute. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if that's you, I want you to shoot your hand in the air. One, two, three. Just shoot your hand in the air if that's you. I want Jesus. Quick, quick, quick. I see the hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Keep your hand there. If you're online, shoot your hand up right there in the emoji. I see your hands. You can put your hands down. 
Can I get everybody in the room to just simply pray this prayer with me? Just say this with me. Say, Jesus, today I acknowledge I can't save myself. I need you. I am asking you to be the Lord of my life. I repent of my sins. I believe that you've paid the price so that I could have life. And today, I'm declaring you are Lord forever and ever in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, can somebody put your hands together?